This is Karen Launchbaugh with the Integrated Rangeland Management class at the University of Idaho, and we've talked about what demand animals have for nutrients and energy throughout the season. We've also talked about how plants grow and what sorts of energy they supply to animals. Now it's time to put two and two together and talk about matching forage supply with the forage demand. Let's start with the big picture. If you're doing range livestock production, you should at minimum maintain the health of the rangeland and the health of the animals. That's your duty as a land steward. Secondly, most of most people that do range livestock production are in it to make some money either for their families or maybe their corporation and for their communities. So range livestock production is a really important element of rural communities throughout the West. The challenge is that forage production is driven by things that we have no control over, such as temperature, soil characteristics, plant characteristics and residue, and it changes radically from year to year. The key then is to understand the system, to create productive and healthy rangelands and animals. Another big picture point that we need to keep in mind is that as plants mature, the amount of fiber in those plants increases from when they're young to when they're mature and when they are dormant. And the amount of protein, energy, vitamins, minerals, all of that decreases throughout the life cycle of the plant. So let's take a closer look at how that forage supply varies across the season on rangelands. In the spring, we start out with not much biomass, but very high quality. And as that grass starts to grow, we get more and more digestible energy and nutrients about until the time the plant produces seed or starts to flower and produce seed. That would be peak biomass. In most of the Northern Hemisphere, that's early summer. And then throughout the summer, the plant just starts to uh, degrade. It's not growing anymore, so it starts to break down. And by the time you get to fall, the actual amount of digestible nutrients and energy is, is quite low, back down to that level of dormancy that we'll see throughout the winter. Now compare that to animal demand. This graph should look fam familiar from when we talked about animal demand. In the spring, uh, this is a graph of female range herbivores, whether it be cows, sheep, elk, or deer. In the spring, they have pretty low energy requirements, just meeting their maintenance. As that last third of trimester, as the young inside of them, their fetus starts to grow, they have a growing need for energy and nutrients. That energy and nutrients goes up radically when they have their young and they start to produce milk. The amount of milk or demand for lactation then decreases throughout the summer into the fall until the time when either we as livestock producers wean the cows and calves or when wildlife normally go through just this self-weaning process where the mother quits producing milk. And that happens in the fall, late summer or fall. And then throughout the winter, those uh, females are just maintaining their nutrient uh, demand and energy at a level of maintenance. Now, if we overlay that forage supply on western rangelands with that animal demand curve of most western rangeland production or uh, situations, and it's certainly this is what happens with wildlife, is that they have their fawns, calves, etc., in the spring, late spring. So cattlemen that do that, or sheep producers that have uh, lambs and uh, calves in the late spring, they're, they're matching the demand with the supply. So in other words, the animals start lactating just about the time that the forage supply is really starting to be abundant. And you can see that if you do this, there's only a couple times of year where the forage supply may not be adequate for the demand of the animal. And those would be early in the spring or kind of late in the fall and, and winter. Now you might think about how this could change if you did something like fall calving. So the, the timing of, of calving is really important here. So if, if we move that to fall calving, we'd see that throughout the summer, the animal has fairly low demand at a time when the forage supply is quite abundant. And then that when if you were to calve in the fall, then that demand for lactation goes up significantly. And then there's quite a period where the forage supply quality is low, the demand is high, and we'd have to find a way to meet animal demand in that fall and winter. Now I have to say, I've, I've done some thinking about this. It, it is expensive, but there are many other reasons why Calving in the fall might might have an advantage just within the, the family or in combination with the grazing permit. So although this is economically expensive, it might offset other expenses. A similar thing can happen if you calve, if an, a person calves or has lambs too early, then the uh, highest demand of, of lactation is happening before the forage supply is abundant. Um, and then 
one has to feed. So we're going to talk later about supplementation, but think about the, the demand, the um, goal of trying to match that supply and demand so that you can limit the amount of feed that you need to supplement. Here's just a graph from uh, uh, Del Curdo and Turner uh, for some cow-calf operations out of uh, the western states, the sagebrush grasslands in, in Oregon, actually. If you looked at the grass crude protein throughout the year, what you see is that in May, June, July, crude protein is going down from about 18% at high peak down to, say, 6-8% in July, August, September, October. What the cow needs to survive is uh, at least six or seven percent so cow alone is that bottom line and if you have a cow and calf pair that they they need even more so this is why it's important to think about those months when you could meet the demand of protein for cows and calves and that would be may june and early you know may and and early june cows themselves could meet their demand through most of the year but you might have to help them with some protein supplementation or finding some way for them to meet their protein needs in the winter, late summer and winter. So how do they meet this demand? How do animals meet their demand? Well, first of all, they eat. They have dry matter intake, DMI. That's the plant material the animal consumes. Um, and the DMI uh, is all, dry matter is void of water. So it's without the water being in the calculation. Uh, animals consume approximately 1.5 to 4% of their body weight of dry matter each day. Um, some variations, uh, Spanish goats, buck, black buck, antelope, calves, they're young animals, they have high energy demand. They're small, so they have high energy demand per unit body weight, and they need about 4% of their body weight for DMI. Fallow deer, sheep, mule deer, white-tailed deer, also fairly small, herbivores, about 3.5% of body weight. Beef cattle in that range of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds, need more like 2% of their body weight. In this class, we're gonna use that term 2.5% of body weight. So just in, in your head, realize that it's about 2.5% of body weight animals need to eat every day to meet their demand, and that varies by the size and age of the animal. So here's an example. This is some mule deer. If you had a mule deer that weighed 200 pounds and it consumed about 3.5% of its body weight uh, in dry matter every day, they would need to consume seven pounds of plant material. On, on a daily basis each day. How do you do that? How can you help animals meet that demand? Well, one thing that we as livestock producers can do on rangeland is to stock conservatively, to set the number of animals out there far below what the range is supplying. So set the demand below the supply. What this does is it gives more forage per animal to choose from. So each animal can select the most nutritious food for their, for their own diet. So we find that when stocking rates are low, animals um, have more nutritious diets because they get maximum selectivity and that usually improves the forage quality and certainly does not limit the amount that they can eat. The other thing about stocking conservatively is that animals don't have to travel as far to meet their energy demand or their, their um, intake demand so it reduces the energy required to find an adequate diet every day. So stocking conservatively is one way that we can help animals meet their demand. Timing is, a, is an important factor that we can manage to help animals meet their demand throughout the season. So we plan for the time of greatest animal need to coincide with the time of greatest animal supply. So here's some ways that we might do that. First of all, we already talked about having animals uh, birth in the spring, have their young in the spring when the forage is of greatest quantity and fairly high quality. So native animals already do this as part of their natural selection. We as livestock producers can do it by having calves and lambs at the right time in the spring. Timing is the basis of seasonal suitability grazing or follow the green. It's a, it's a pattern of grazing where animals are in on winter range down at low elevations and then they follow elevation up and they essentially follow the green as the plants grow up, uh, green up in higher elevations and snow subsides then the, the animals are there at the time when the plants are most nutritious. So that's another way to make timing work. It doesn't work everywhere but it certainly works in Idaho and the Intermountain West where we have significant elevation gradients. Also might consider the type of forage. We notice that um, winter is the time that it's often difficult to meet animal demand and we know that some forages are better uh, and more nutritious in the winter compared to others. So we might talk about or think about planting winter forages, such as shrubs. We'll talk more about that. And then finally, you might consider the operation. It's difficult to meet the demand of cows and calves over the winter. 
Um, but you could just completely change the operation to a stalker animal operation, stalker steers and heifers that are on the range only during the growing season. And then when the forage starts to get low and the animals start not to grow as fast, then you just sell the animals. And there's no animals on the ranch over the winter at a time when it will be difficult to meet their energy demand. So think outside the box. Try to find a way where you're helping animals meet their demand by coinciding with the forage supply that you have. The other thing we can do is manipulate the vegetation to meet the animals' needs. Um, we could plant introduced pastures to provide abundant high forage, uh, high quality forage in, in a particular season. For example, early in the spring, crested wheatgrass is a very good spring and fall forage. There are other plants that we can plant in the spring to provide um, really early green up and good forage, and some that hold their nutrients well into the fall. Uh, there's some new rye grasses, for example, that are being developed to that maintain their protein levels well into the winter. So thinking about the vegetation that's available, maybe you can change it to make sure that the supply is meeting demand. Um, one of the most important things in terms of helping animals meet their demand is using shrubs. We learned earlier how important shrubs are because they maintain their protein and phosphorus during the dormant season. So it's important to maintain palatable shrubs if you want help to help animals meet their demand for protein and minerals in the winter. Uh, one example is how heavily shrubs on mountain benches are used by deer. That's, per, that's good winter habitat where the snow is not very deep and those shrubs are up above the snow. There's even been some studies where cattle grazing in the spring is used to reduce the grass biomass and, produce, and promote the shrub biomass. So there are things we could do to really promote shrubs besides just planting shrubs. Just the general acts of managing plant diversity, the more diverse our forage supply is the more species that are there, the more the increased um, supply will have throughout the season because each plant um, matures at a different rate and at a different and so it has different levels of nutrients. So some plants are are good in the spring, others in the summer, and others in the fall. So that having a good plant diversity to help meet those demands is important. Now, how do animals cope with these periods? What do animals do? How can we help them along their way? One thing is that we the animals build up fat during the summer when forage high um, quality is high, and then they use that throughout the win winter. Most grazing animals, if they have really good fat reserves, they can survive a month or two, 30 to 60 days, with little or no food consumption. So it's really important that we as managers maintain high body condition and fat reserves. There was even some studies done with mule deer quite some time ago where they um, it found that if animals had high fat reserves, they could um, survive nearly complete starvation for 64 days, so almost two months with no food at all. Um, fat supplies uh, are important also because uh, there are several fat-soluble uh, vitamins, such as vitamin A. And so as fat is used, uh, vitamin A and E are in the fat, and they also they then supply the animal with those um, vitamins throughout the winter. Uh, native animals n naturally have this ability to lower their metabolic rate in the winter, which um, reduces their energy requirement. Again, we talked about this. Domestic animals don't tend to change their metabolic rate very much, but um, native animals do have a lower metabolic rate in the winter than in the growing season. Some more mechanisms that animals have to um, help them cope with these periods of low forage quality. Some native animals, such as bison, have the ability to recycle nutrients more so than uh, domestic animals. That what happens is nitrogen, when it's absorbed into the room, it is it is absorbed to the liver and then put back into the saliva, where it goes back through the digestive system for possible digestion, for possible absorption, and certainly use by microbes in the gut. And so, in other words, the the nitrogen is put back into saliva and back through the digestive system instead of being lost in urine. Wild animals, especially, um, you, uh, are known to ingest soil. There's, there are salt licks and soil licks across the West where um, wild animals, uh, ruminants especially, congregate to select to get minerals for them. This picture here is from uh, an area in uh, Montana where these um, critters are out there on the road actually just trying to get salt and minerals right in front of some cars and they're causing quite a traffic jam. Now let's talk about supplementation. This is the, this active process by which us human managers give animals forage or nutrients to meet their demand. 
it's a it's need to be very careful with this because it's a major operation expense confronting all range livestock industry it's rarely economical to supplement and when you go to um to workshops and seminars on livestock production many times they'll talk about trying to reduce supplementation because it is so expensive the goal then should be really to use the vegetation that's readily there and find ways to minimize supplementation and use the forage that's there another downside of supplementation is that when you do supplement animals especially with energy they will tend to quit eating the forage out on the range so with all good intentions you might be trying to give animals energy and then they will just quit grazing out on the range and trying to harvest a couple kinds of energy uh, one is grains high quality energy this generally improves uh, it's generally impractical on rangelands especially except under really drought conditions or really heavy snow where you're just trying to make it through a period without trying to sell animals it can be effective for young animals such as in creep feeders where the young animal has access to the supplement and the older animals don't so that's one way that we might kind of get higher quality forage in those young animals as they grow the other kind of energy supplement would be low energy supplements like hay and straw um, many people feed hay and straw in the winter it uh, it's can be necessary to help animals meet their daily dry matter requirement in winter and in drought and again the key is just to minimize the amount of straw or hay that's being fed uh, and remember that stray ha uh, hay and straw are basically forms of cellulose so those are used as fermentable energy by the animals protein supplementation uh, there are many reasons that protein supplementation can be more feasible on rangelands because the use of forage may actually increase with nitrogen supplementation and that's because it that, that protein can fuel the digestive uh, processes in the rumen sometimes we can even use non-protein nitrogen such as urea urea and biuret these are fairly low cost compared to protein and what happens by feeding the animal uh, an, an inorganic form of nitrogen it's converted to protein by the rumen microbes so the rumen microbes have the ability to use these inorganic nitrogens and then they incorporate them into their own microbial bodies and they become protein for the animal so you can use non-protein nitrogen sources for up to about a third of the to total protein requirement and in this picture you'll see a crystallix tub which is used for which is a way to give animals energy and nitrogen high protein feeds can be used or often used to alfalfa for example cottonseed meal soybean meal uh, peas and lentils up in the northwest uh, any compound any uh, plant product that has high protein can be used to help animals uh, meet pr protein demands um, I meant, mentioned that protein supplements can really help the animal to eat more forage and, and really forage more efficiently because we need to keep the uh, amount of protein in the rumen above 6% because if you fall below 6% or so rumen microbial growth is inhibited and then all those structural carbohydrates in the standing dead grass become undigestible they, they can't be digested because the rumen microbial growth is inhibited and therefore the rumen microbes are not able to turn those stems of grass into energy so there's that one break point where it's important to have enough protein so that animals can keep their their rumens going and that point is at about six percent in summary a few take-home messages remember that plant quality decreases as plants mature it's just a natural process animal nutrition demands change throughout the year depending on what stage of their life cycle they're, they're in are they growing lactating fattening gestating where are they at in their life cycle that will determine how much they need to consume and uh, what their demand is each day meeting that demand is best handled by timing the nutrient supply with the animal demand so most of this lecture has talked about how can we match those two curves up uh, if you manage land to increase diversity of vegetation to meet animal dams that's that's one very important way to help animals meet their daily supply having a diversity of grasses forbs and especially shrubs in the winter wildlife can lower their metabolic rate and limit energy expenditures in the winter uh, when nutrients are scarce uh, domestic animals don't have the ability to do this to any great extent perhaps a little so supplementation may help animals meet demand but it's costly and the one kind of supplement that might be most effective would be protein supplements if you have enough standing grass dead grass that's energy but you might need protein 
to make sure that the gut, the rumen is active enough to take advantage of that standing grass. Those are just a few ideas of how we help animals on rangeland manage the forage supply to meet the animal demand. It's a really important question when managing any kind of animal on rangelands and our knowledge of the ecosystems, plant and animal will help us accomplish that.